My name's Dave Bradley. I'm basically your standard citizen activist because someone stepped on me and I said no more, right? That's all it takes. Um, once we find other people like ourselves that got stepped on or friends that got stepped on, it's really easy to help them. So other people came to me and I helped them not get stepped on because the reality is government is authority of force. And when we elect people into office, if they don't understand their role, they use that force for the benefit of either themselves or their friends, which are considered lobbyists because they're the ones pitching to government to do things. So when we say, don't raise my taxes or don't do this, we're lobbyists. The difference is we're not as organized as they are. And we don't profit from it as much except for us individually, as other lobbyists do. So they get a lot more leverage on that political official to abuse his power because there's a benefit for him. There, there's a lobbyist advantage, a business advantage, typically. So once the government decides to pick winners and losers, there's lobbyist leverage to decide who's a winner and who's a loser, right? If anybody's um, ever seen the uh, uh, pipeline go in and they recognize who's got the right to put that pipeline and get that eminent domain, that's all government leverage. When they do the power lines, when you do your cable company, when you do all these things, that's government leverage. They're going to pick winners and losers. So what we want to do is keep them accountable. So I got a four-step presentation I just want to kind of hit. It's mostly about enlightening what's available. So the first step one is you got to personally establish a set of moral rigid principles and logical guidelines. So once you recognize and know what your moral principle is, the odds of you crossing it or, or failing in that respect is lower because you've already know what it is. You already defined it, right? Whether it's I'm married or I'm not going to steal from my neighbor or I'm not going to kick him in the shins. These are moral principles. I'm not going to hurt another person. I'm not going to do certain things. Once you establish them and actually know what they are, you're less likely to violate them. It's just, it is. But people that don't really establish their own moral principles tend to get sticky, and then they tend to gravitate towards, well, I can cheat when you play Monopoly. It doesn't really count. Or I can do this when you're doing this because it doesn't really count. And that's the moral principles that we notice that government officials that haven't defined them tend to violate very frequently and, and reasonably. And if they don't really uh, uh, get a chance to pull them aside and talk to them and say, I think you're violating one of the most simple tenets, don't do that, they'll get defensive before they'll get open-minded. But if they had a moral principle, the odds are you can appeal to it as citizens, and we usually win. So when you elect people that have moral principles, that's always a good thing because you can use it to the advantage of government, right? And then logical guidelines. So you'll see on our, when we do our uh, uh, Know Thy Enemy, and we'll show you what the enemy looks like, some people make arguments that just defy real logic. If I say that I bought a red car because she bought a red car or he bought a red car, and that's why I need a red car, Where's the logical, rational thought? Or because my last one was red, or because the one before that was red, or dogmatically I pick red cars. Now, you, if you emotionally say I like red cars and buy them, that's fine. But from a logical argument, why is the car red is a function of what is the logic? Well, they were cheaper, they were statistically I like it, or whatever that logic is, right? So you're looking at a logical guideline. So the, one of the simple ones that we dealt with recently at our little government is, should a government spend more than it takes? That's a pretty, that's a logical guideline, right? Should you be able to tax and take money more, or could you spend more than you physically took it in? Will you use future person's monies to pay for things that you want today? Should a tax of tomorrow's child pay for a benefit of today's child? And should I burden that child with this child's responsibility? That's a, that's a moral principle and a logical guideline. And if you don't make that evident, it's really hard to get through to people when they get themselves fired up, and you'll see it. They, they really fail this logical fallacy concept, and it's really hard to make them understand. It's, it's, in your paperwork, it's called the um, allegory of the cape. We'll get into that in a second. So establish moral guidelines, 
or moral principles, right? And logical guidelines, right? The step two is going to be gather data. Step three is know thy enemy. And step four is take your seats, right? So gather data. All right, so the first thing you're going to do is provide your own transparency. Most governments aren't very transparent. You've got to force them to do it. Um, we actually, I took the time to make a resolution with our opinion that says very simple logic. If I can file a right to know and you have to give me that information, why not give it to me before I file a right to know? Mm. Right? Pretty logical. Logical guideline. And meets a moral principle. If information and transparency is good for government, then you give it out before they're asked, it costs you less money. It takes you less time. It's easier to do. You can physically say this piece of paper is a right to know requestable document. So just scan it and publish it. Throw it in a big pile on the internet. Make it OCR, optical character rec recognition, searchable, and then publish it. And if somebody asks you for a right to know, rather than spend the money to go find it and get it, say, did you check our archive first? Feel free to. And then if that, that right to know agreement is a contract between you and government, I have a right to know this information, and you have a responsibility to give it to me. And as soon as you stand at a podium and say, I want to know how much we spent on that, whatever, bridge, they don't have to answer you. And they usually don't. But if you stand at the podium and say, I want to know it, and here is my right to know paper, which becomes a contract with government to say, you owe me this information. You now have five days to give it to me or give me an excuse why you're not going to give it to me in five days, but in 30 days. And if you don't like the answer they gave you, since you have a contract with them, a written contract with government, there is an agency in Harrisburg that says... Yep, that agency violated your contract. Give him the information. Or that agency did not violate the contract. You don't get this information for whatever reason. They'll give you a reason. And then you can request a different way. But the whole idea is every time you stand in a meeting and you feel like you wasted your time, fill out the contract. Help governments work, right? Don't just sit there and bitch and moan. Do something about it, right? So that's this right to know information. So. When I did this resolution, it says that we will publish, to publish all documents available under the right to know law prior to a request. Right? I just wanted our government to do this. Why not? Just publish it. Right? And alternately, provide a mechanism for reprimand to the Office of Open Records that chastises an agency that wastes taxpayers' dollar on repeated and absurd challenges to transparency. Because if you try to go to our district with this contract, our lawyer gets paid to find a way to try to violate this contract. Uh, you know, um, I don't have it in paper. I don't have it electronically formed. I'm going to have to copy it. I'm going to have to pay to redact it. I'm going to have to bill you for information that you would normally get. Because it was an email, so it's electronic. They should just give it to you as email. You're allowed to have it in whatever form it was created in. So this is, this is the games they play, right? And that's some of the things that when they get reprimanded, I, I asked for a video of the uh, lobby inside of our district because I was accused of crazy things, right? I said, well, give me the video, it's right there. Sorry, that's Act 22, right? Which is police force. So now they're saying that video is a police force video. At which point I said, Sounds like BS to me. Hey, hey, Harrisburg, they're telling me I can't have it and they're claiming that it's a police force. Right? I mean, school district. At which point, the Office of Open Records wrote back and said, Lee Heighton, that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. That's an absurd, and absurd is a legal term for, you know, absurd. But, but at the same time, it, it's very, it, it's a specific, term saying you're way outside the reading of the law. What are you doing? Please re retrench yourself politely. It's absurd, right? It's an absurd ar argument. At which point, the only recourse I had would be to go to court and fight this absurd argument of the system, which has cost people money. We don't want to do that, right? So, so this 
resolution. This is a, like another contract. And if you can take this one, change the name of it, and take it to everywhere we go, and say, why don't you pass this? Because it is logical. It's a moral rigid principle. And transparency is a disinfectant to government. So it's a good thing, right? So that's one of the things we did. Um, another thing we did is when we found out that we want to seek information, right? Which is what the right to know law is about. But if you have access to information, don't just go look at it. Take a copy of it. And if you look at this paper that I gave you, pass that down. This is, this is me as a board of director that is authorized to review invoices. And this took a court battle to win this opportunity. But in the state of Pennsylvania, a director of a school board has to authorize the invoice. You cut the grass, let me see that you cut the grass. Let me see your contract, let me see your pay. Okay, you can have your money, right? You cut the grass. Makes sense. Anyone would recognize that the chief executive officer, the, the board of directors overseeing that chief executive officer would want to make sure that A, he has a contract to cut it, B, he cut it, and C, that the pay was done properly. We actually had a board of director out in the western part of Pennsylvania had to go to court for this because they hired a solicitor. He wanted to see the bill of the solicitor. So the solicitor took him to court and said, he's not allowed to see my bills. At which point he went to court, he did this thing, did the right to know, he won. So he gave us, as directors across the state, if we would like to use it, the right to review invoices. So as soon as I said, I want to review them, the old business manager we had said, well, which ones? Come on, what's the next answer? Oh, all of them. them. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to see all of them. Well, there's 2,000 of them every month or whatever, 4,000 pages. Okay, sounds good. When do we want to meet? And he said, how are you going to review 2,000 invoices? I said, don't worry about it. My job is to review them, right? Your job is to provide them to me. So I put up a stand, and my buddy hooked me up with this because he's a, the camera guru. He made a stand, fixed focus, on a tripod, did his thing, points it right down the paper, and all I did was put it in, push the little button, page after page after page, 2,000 pages, 2,000 pictures. Computer program automatically crops them and automatically loads them onto the web. I don't have to. I mean, I can renew that. I can review them. It's my job to do so. But I can also enlist an army of individuals that want to help keep government accountable to say, when you're bored, instead of watching, you know, some other TV show, scroll through 20 of these things. See what you read. See what you see. And then you can just scroll through and you can look at each bill, each invoice, and each thing and say, hey, look what I found. Look what I found. And the way I want to set it up now in our government they're trying to pass a, a, a budget, I want to set it up that here's the budget, here's what we're trying to save, and if anybody can find a new way to save more, treat it as a bounty. I'm going to publish all this information. You guys find me a, a way to save more money, right? Because it's not just my eyes, it's everybody's eyes. We'll collect that money. At the end of the year, we'll give it back to the taxpayers mm -hmm. as a function. And then going forward, you'll be, you'll be steering this government more towards efficiency you'll be steering it more towards a moral, logical guideline. Because if we see that we cut the grass two times in one week, four times in a week, <laughs> right? The same lawn, four times in a week, someone can say, wait a second. It's real easy to slip in four invoices. How about four trips to Lowe's or four trips to the gas station the same day? Or how about up in Scranton where they were doing flat tires? For a quarter million dollars or so you know whatever I, I don't know what the final number was but the guy's charges felony charges or whatever they're going to charge the guy up in scranton taking the bus in i got to get this repaired i got to get this fixed i got to get this done over and over and over and over. hundreds of thousands of dollars was consumed and it's easy to do because nobody's looking right so to keep government accountable which is the reason we're here we want you to look so we want you to Provide your own transparency, seek information, and then the next one is ask questions, right? So there's, the, there's a theory in our work called the five whys, right? Somebody shows up late to work, right? You want to get to the root cause. So you say, why are we late to work? Well, I woke up late. Okay, why did you wake up late? Well, my alarm didn't go off. Okay, that's two whys, right? Why didn't your alarm go off? Why well, didn't set it, right? Okay, why didn't you set it? 
right? Or what were you supposed to do? Well, I was supposed to check it the night before to make sure it was set so that it goes off, so that I can get up, so that I can get to work on time. It's a pretty simple concept, right? Something you teach your 12 year old. But the reality is by going down this path of why, not just why were you late because I left late, but go back to the, the really the root cause. You didn't even set the alarm and check it the night before. If you go to the root cause of why are we paying four bills to a, a grass cutter? Why are we doing these things? If we can find that root cause, we can steer government as a lobbyist, right? And then the next one we want you to do is go to the meetings. So when you see these videos, you're gonna, you're gonna understand that somebody went to a meeting, pushed record, and now we have evidence that I use in the next section called Know Thy Enemy, right? And it's very simple to do. Everybody has a cell phone. You can live stream it right from there anymore, and the batteries last long enough. What I did was I realized that there's an untapped resource of teenagers that need gas money. And you guys are affluent individuals that have $20 in your pocket that love the idea of not having to do something but supporting youth and their ability to have gas money. So you give them 20 bucks to go to their local meeting and you tell them record this and upload it to this website for me or upload it to this Dropbox or upload it to this thing. Here's your 20 bucks. Right? And the reality is they waste an hour videotaping a meeting and the byproduct of this is not only that you get the meeting that you wanted to record it, like we did when you see Beth Line this morning, it's crazy what they were doing in there. But you can analyze what's happening and you can see this and over the 10 years that I've been doing this with these kids and these people doing this, we learned tons of stuff of what's going on and how to really fix it because there is a, a root cause problem of why this happens and we're electing the wrong people. They don't understand the, the, the process there, right? So if you can tell your grandkid or whatever, the byproduct is not just that you get this video. Guess what else you have? After this kid sits in some stupid meeting, videotaping it, and watching how their government works. What's that? Another witness. You, another witness, but even better. They, and you educate, it drives them nuts. They're looking at these people sitting on a thing with no clue at all how the world works and asking themselves, hey, Mr. Bradley, what's this about? This guy doesn't know how to Google something, you know, or, or this guy doesn't even <coughs> understand basic math, or, you know, how, how, do, how do you do? And I say, well, that's why you're there. And the next part of that whole thing, this, the step four, this keep running out. Get that kid to run for office. Take their seat. Most of those people are uncorruptible. Because once they understand what the problem is, they're willing to walk in and go do it. So I'm going to repeat myself here a little bit. So establish a uh, set of moral rigid principles. Establish these logical guidelines so we know what they are. And you guys should know your own. And they're different. And everybody's going to have different ones. But it's OK. It's a discussion. You're going to gather data and provide your own transparency. You're going to go to meetings and record them, right? Live stream them, post them. You're going to seek information through a right to know. You're going to gather invoices because we know those are things now you can ask for and get very easily, right? And you're going to walk into a meeting and ask them to create a resolution to save the county or the town or the district money by publishing it before you show up. Because you can show up and inspect records anytime you want, take your camera, and just click, 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 and share away, right? And then you want to share that information. So now we're going to go to Know Thy Enemy. So let's try this on for size. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant that this thing's going to work for me. Let's see. Uh, there's a couple different... They wanted your kids to make it work. I know. Well, he did. And he, they're the ones that uh, hooked me up with this thing because they had a... a uh, They lost the actual remote that came with it. So this is the, uh... all right, so let's do this right. So here we're gonna do, this first one, we're gonna call this um, ignorance of public officials, right? Know thy enemy, right? He says, I don't create the budget. Yeah, 
Okay, so just to help out, I told you this is going to be bad, but we'll try. I'll turn this up all the way. All right, so what happened was this, this, this school district wants to create a budget. School code says the board of directors creates the budget. We decide how much we should pay the grants coverage, right? Now, very much using the information from the district, how much did you spend last year cutting your grass, right? You gotta have a baseline, you gotta know where you're at. But you don't do baseline budgeting, well whatever it costs last year is gonna cost more this year, right? Just add to it. That's called baseline budgeting. That's the biggest way to steal our taxpayers' money. Yeah. So once you know what's going on, because we know the enemy, this is what they do, we as a group can educate each other and say, hey, don't let them do that, right? Because we know that's bad. So what we do is we find out how much grass they wanna cut, then you can bid it out, you can check things, you can see what's going on, but the board creates the budget. State law says we're responsible, we authorize it, we're the ones that vote on it, we're the ones that do it, we create the budget. This is a business manager saying, hey, every school I've ever worked at, they never create the budget. I still have some hair left, but I'm getting there, right? I'm like, holy smokes, am I hearing this right thing? So this is what we call the allegory of the cave, we'll, we'll bring up that later, but it also shows that none of these guys read. And we showed them in school code where it says we are the ones to create this budget. And then ignorance steps up and says, oh, I never did that. So let's try this again. Two more four approval. In no instance have I ever been involved in a school district where the nine members of the board make up a budget and bring it forward to the administration of the school district. So welcome to the new world, right? Yeah. What I do, I get my budget. Here. First time ever, apparently, right? They're trying to hide, they're trying to block it right now, but. So you're saying the administration says gives the budget. They do the budget, not board directors. Yep, but I want you to rubber stamp it, and I want you to authorize it, I want you to do it. And she's using the, the, the logical fallacy of dogma, saying, well, that's the way it's always been. I always buy a red car, right? They're, they're using the same process, right? It's always brought forward from the people This is, the, this is the solicitor, this is the superintendent. We make the statement, the board is responsible to do this job. Am I right? And he finally says, yes, you are. Duly noted, can we move on now? Don't go telling everybody. Don't go rubbing it in, right? Let's move on, and it's, it's lunacy. But the reality is, this guy doesn't step up, and we try to get him to step up and, and get it on tape because we this want this evidence of this knuckleheadism. With the new business manager, yet we ask for details about that conflict. We have not been provided it. The board has not been provided I have not been provided So what I've reviewed with other knowledgeable individuals to create and work together with the This is the guy that says he didn't think they had a, that they were even responsible to do the district. And, and the other knowledgeable individuals that I did, I went to all the districts that had violations and felony charges and looked at the auditor's reports and the auditor general. I read what they said, and then we went to the Pennsylvania Department of Education, I listened to what they said, and I said, wow, there's a whole bunch of information that none of these people know. And it's just ignorance. Now he's laughing like, who would I talk to, right? Like district's information, which is lacking. I recognize that this board does not have the information needed to make an effective decision. So I asked for a meeting. I want to clarify the history of the sword. All right, so now we're moving on to the next uh, uh, know thy enemy. This is the guy's hungry for power. This is Bethlehem, right? Again, recorded the thing, put it online, gave it to Otto, put the mind. I know it was short notice, but sometimes we don't get the information until it's just time, right? And when you hear the mayor, you're going to hear him say, and you're almost going to hear him with this concept of, oh my God, what are you guys doing here? We had this twice already on our agenda, and no one was here. And now, all of a sudden, everybody comes out of the woodwork. 
when we're ready to pass it, right? We're gonna we're gonna pass this past the goal line, and now you guys are stopping us. And the reality is, thank you, Sandy. We got the information to Sandy. We got the information to everybody else. Enough people showed up, and that was the only opportunity was the camera and people showing, and they pulled it from the from the thing. But when you hear the two things we're going to show you on this one is you're going to hear the mayor's little speech, pre-described speech, and you want I want you to listen to his anxiety of not being able to do this. And what he wanted to do was that any time five people were together, they had to buy a permit to be a demonstration, right? Completely against the First Amendment, but just bear with it. Five people together outside mm -hmm. makes a group, and therefore they need a permit, two weeks notice, and hire two police officers for every demonstrator. Where was this? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Now, here's the issue. They had some, I don't know if it was Antifa or somebody came in, they were causing some issues, and instead of arresting them for disturbing the peace, they felt that they weren't allowed to do anything, so now they wanted to make this new ordinance to stop all the lullabying people from singing Christmas carols, from doing whatever you want to do. It gives authority, and they're hungry for power. And just think of the overtime it's pumping on this buddy system of the police department and the mayor. And now think about the solicitor that's reading this ordinance that says, you as a demonstration needs a permit and I'm gonna block you from your First Amendment right. How many First Amendment violations are we gonna be fighting in court right now? Mm -hmm. Right? That solicitor's getting paid. So why didn't he me. stop it before it happened? Two other times it was on the, on the agenda and then nobody stopped it and then everybody came out of the woodwork and said, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they got it that far down the path. Yeah, and if I can okay. just reiterate, when he talks about people showing up, Antifa, well, when Bernie Sanders was down in Allentown, the Lehigh Valley showed up, mm -hmm. and they didn't like that. I'm right. sure they did. So, they did. And it's, it depends on what, agreed, but you'll listen to the mayor, but before that I put this extra two minutes on or minute on. This is the head of the council. Prior to this video, he took a vote to say, I'm going to cut this from the agenda. And then I all said, I, right? And everybody in the room sat there. It's a good thing, right? Well, I'm one of the few people that have read the Sunshine Act that says if you're going to put a new motion on an agenda, it's a new item, prior to doing an action of government, the people have a right to speak about that new action. So when he raised his hand and said, I make a motion that we move this and take it off the agenda, he should have first said, after he got a second, he should have first said, okay, new item, anyone here would like to speak about this? Let's do it now, right? Because he's gonna move this budget. That's a sunshine violation. Now what's funny is, this is the solicitor. Watch how fast he understands what I'm saying and what I'm doing, he doesn't get it, he doesn't know. But this guy does, and yeah, 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 good idea, but now nah, come on, keep moving. We'll do it afterwards, we'll do something else. And he just wants to push it off because he knows he already violated the law. So you walk into the courthouse, you file it with the district attorney, you say, this guy violated the law, because he did, and it's on video, and you go ring the bell, he gets fined 100 bucks and says, don't do it again, and this is how you educate somebody to the law. You give them a speeding ticket. You know, it's a, it's a misdemeanor, it's like a parking violation. But if you can watch government and see that they don't do their job, you can educate them with either a slap on the wrist, by video, which I can't wait to send them a copy of it, right? Set the administration's goals. Two years ago, we were approached by Arts Quest to see what could be done to address this the is the mayor first, sorry. arising from an organized county local group who occupied an Arts Quest outdoor location on the south side during a public event. They insulted members of the public, used terrible language. Some members of the public inquired if the city could exclude such groups from demonstrations on public property. It was quickly understood. And on our part, that the First Amendment considerations do not allow an exclusionary solution to ordinance. However, I considered it reasonable to give Arts Quest the opportunity for its representatives to contribute ideas about how to address their concerns. Our assistant solicitor was assigned to work with them to develop some procedures and if reasonable, an ordinance. So, right there, he's already said, I'm letting a lobbyist group, Arts Quest, tell us what to do. And I just hired my solicitor. I'm paying money to a solicitor to help them. And if an ordinance is in order, 
using the solicitor, a lawyer, will bring it forward. I'll think that through. The ordinance is this two police officers and stopping people from assembling and needing a permit and $75 to get the permit. What solicitor in his right mind would say in a meeting, well, that's a good idea, <laughs> except for the one that's getting paid on the other side, right? So he thinks that he had all this authority, meaning a solicitor and these other groups, come to him and said it was a good idea. So now he's going to rubber stamp it. Although we submitted this ordinance to council early in April, and has been in the public domain for two months, surprisingly attracted very little attention from the public. City Council recently conducted a committee meeting on the ordinance and no one from the public appeared to speak. It has been only during the last several days that the uh, most public concern has, has surfaced and we welcome the public's interest in this important matter. While I have requested a postponement of tonight's final vote indefinitely, I want to make sure three points are clear for the record. First, I have always been a very strong supporter of the First Amendment rights. This is shown by I'm a very strong supporter of the first. How did this get on the, the agenda twice before in committee meetings and a solicitor? I call that as a BS call, right? I mean, that's just BS, right? He's covering his butt after he found out that he screwed up. My record as an elected official since 1996. Two, this ordinance, we seek to impose a reasonable and constitutional time and place regulations so that the city is well positioned to make use of its resources to both accommodate free speech and make sure everyone can participate safely. Which is the two police officers per demonstrator getting paid to do this job. So in other words, if there's five demonstrators... Ten cops. Ten cops? Yeah, because the, the logic was, not, not well defined, but the logic was to protect you from them and them from you. <laughs> and they want breach, right? I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to pay overtime, you might as well do it right. Yeah. But notice that he's still mad selling the idea about why it's still good. It doesn't make any sense. This is consistent with why I support the First Amendment rights. Third, one of my responsibilities as mayor is to be responsive to public concerns. I'm glad the public has shown interest. I'll be at only a short time before the final vote. The final vote. <laughs> he's actually mad. I'm glad they showed up, but boy. He showed up late, didn't I? <laughs> right? Because now he looks the, a little bit like the fool. Well, schedule on this ordinance. However, because of many comments, I consider it best and responsive to take the time needed to consider all the constructive comments, including those from members of city council, and therefore I'm, I'm requesting two members of council to postpone action on this ordinance indefinitely. Thank you. So, Thank you. when you think one of those is very too loose. So this is so now they're going to go to public comment and listen to this thing. At which point I'm going to bring up the idea of why this Sunshine Act took place before. You're going to hear the solicitor. But how many people here, listening to that mayor do his Mayakopa, believe that he still doesn't want this ordinance, or that he even knew what he was doing before he got to this <laughs> cold one, and then people finally showed up. He felt justified because no one was there. He literally felt justified. Since no one showed up, it must be okay. Someone teaches our government that idea. And the reality is most government officials, and we had this conversation with this lady and this other person earlier in this meeting because they were talking about building a new pool. And I said, you paid money to buy signs to run for office. Am I correct? Oh, yeah. yeah. And it was expensive. Yeah. And you knocked on doors and told them you wanted them to vote for you, right? Great. Since then, how many times have you either knocked on the door and talked to those people, bought a sign and said, come to a meeting because I got something I want to talk to you about? Or better yet, send them a postcard the way you send postcards in the mail to every door direct and ask them for your opinion. It's cheap. And you can use, quote, government money to do it. And it's not an expensive thing to do. And it's the right thing to do. I spent all the money to get elected, why don't I listen to them afterwards? And it's a simple concept, and, and everyone's eyes were like deer in headlights. They never even thought of it. And most of these people were re-elected and re-elected in multiple campaigns. They still save the signs because they're expensive. <laughs> and they want to use them next time because they want to get re-elected, but they never go back and ask for information. So prior to this, when the guy's saying there's nobody in this room, he feels justified, but he also didn't go out and ask people specifically we're thinking of doing this. 
what is your idea? What's your thought? And if he did, all of these people in the audience would have showed up earlier with a little note, saved everybody time and money, and said, what are you, nuts? This is a First Amendment violation. Are you trying to pump your police department? Are you trying to pump your solicitor? What's going on, right? Excuse me, sir. I have a point of order to ask. I'll try to be polite. <laughs> Prior to the start of this meeting, or about the start of this meeting, you guys took a vote to move this, correct? We, we took a vote to remove this from our agenda, correct. And when you took that vote, that would be considered an action of government, correct? Mr. Solicitor? The solicitor. I understand that. He didn't answer the question, like a good solicitor, right? He, he did exactly what a good solicitor is supposed to do, divert. Oh, they can vote again afterwards. Because right? they're not going to get a chance to speak. He violated their rights by not giving them a chance to speak before they voted. That's a standard sunshine violation. So they'll, they'll vote again later, is what he said. But, I agree. You agree? And then, they vote again after the public comment? Yes, because they, the reality is you should have opened up the floor to public comment on that subject prior to taking your vote. Yeah, no objection. Thank you. No, no objection. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Lewis. Just for clarification, folks. And so, so, so now he's going to try to pretend he's smart, like he knew, he, like he didn't know that he just violated the Sunshine Act, and he's going to say it again. But he totally misquotes the Sunshine Act. But after public comment, uh, we'll accept. Can step up, uh, Council. If it is the will of Council, we'll take another vote to effectively move this from the agenda. And it's again, not the will of the government, it's the fact that those people have to say that they're going to do, right? Alright, so now here's the next one. Alright, so this is, so everybody gets that, 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 that was a, what I want to call, hungry for power. The mayor wanted authority. He wanted to do something, right? This is another one that we're looking at. This is a zoning hearing board, right? Where they're using existing code on an existing building. Makes sense, right? Well, prior to getting to this hearing, they were going to use the new building code on the existing building, right? Yeah. So that's kind of like a mistake. But when the officer uses the wrong code, he creates chaos. And if it's your business that you're trying to protect, like this guy was, it's going to cost you money, but you're going to fight this. Mm -hmm. You have to fight this. You can't not fight this. At which point you got to hire a lawyer to fight this because the guy made a mistake. When you realize that the guy that made the mistake is getting paid by his local government to do a job and make mistakes, and the solicitor gets paid to cover the mistakes and go to a hearing board, this is a year later. This is a year of process. And then the guy that was on the thing calls me up and says, hey, recorder man, get over here on this one, right? Before the hearing, the solicitor, after churning that bucket for a year, along with the township churning that bucket for a year, and the zoning officer churning the bucket and getting paid for all, they get paid to be at these meetings, right? They're government officials. They're not doing it for free. They're not salaried, right? They're getting paid. After a year, and they know they're going to lose because they did the wrong thing. You're going to hear them say unprecedented, meaning they're not going to set a precedent with this decision, which the zoning hearing board never does, right? No precedent. We're going to admit we made a mistake. We're going to fix it, and we're going to use the existing building code on the existing building. Have a nice day. Sorry we wasted your time. <laughs> and your tens of thousands of attorney dollars in fighting stupid. Mm -hmm. Now, for us to get to this point and record this meeting, we had a dozen of these that we were chasing, trying to find and get opportunity. And then finally, the guy was nice enough to say, I'm waiting until the hearing board does it. We're, we're doing this in front of the board so that we can record everything because we knew this was happening. And after this, we were able to prove and get rid of the wrong guy that's nice, get rid of the wrong person that played politician that was benefiting from all this garbage, right? And get rid of him. It was very easy to do, because once we had gathered the data, sought our information, know the enemy, we decided to take their seat. And we did, and it was instantaneous. As soon as the new official was elected, this guy quit. He knew the jig was up, right? Mm -hmm. 
So watch, this is the, that's the solicitor. If accepted by the board, we would resolve all of the issues tonight. So those stipulations are now strengthened. Uh, strengthened by the uh, for purposes of this hearing only, the board, uh, due to the this board before you, uh, can apply the international existing building code. Uh, the applicant, uh, Mr. Poole, stipulates that uh, based on his calculations on the international existing building code. You can use existing building code for an existing building. What a, what a revolutionary idea. <laughs> uh, he was trying to limit them this year, to like 60 down from 100. So now the guy got even more occupancy. Right. Or we waive the requirement of a sprinkler system with no formal objection by the township. And uh, finally, because we have uh, a new member here, I believe, that was not here at the previous uh, meeting, uh, the parties uh, agreed to uh, uh, allow the participation of the new member of members uh, without any objection. Uh, have I correctly said? It is the position of the township that the testimony was taken. Uh, the testimony that would be elicited would comply with that decision. Defended, and we'll get to churn this machine with the solicitor, and, and everybody gets paid. At the end, we'll just give up and apologize and say we're sorry. Numerous times. It took, how do you get that into a court? How do you get to prove that? How do, nothing. All we have is our data. We can make the statement because we have the data, but we don't have enough to be able to go to court and say, you did this. Now, here's the funny part. Is he allowed to make mistakes? Who's going to hold government accountable? He's allowed to make as many mistakes as he wants. And if the supervisor happens to be a contractor, well, that's kind of okay. I guess as long as you don't make mistakes on my projects. Right? So the point is that can people be ignorant, can they be stupid, and can they make mistakes? And the answer is yes. It's not illegal to be stupid, right? <laughs> At which point, go back to the guy that didn't even know he was responsible for doing the budget. If they stay ignorant, they're fine. They, you know, it's a plausible deniability. So check this one out. This is, uh, this, I think there's the last one. Maybe there's one more. But this guy, <laughs> this is Weissport. They have a guy that has his grass growing high, right? So they got an ordinance. Don't let your grass grow too high. And the way the ordinance is supposed to work is don't let your grass grow too high because your neighbor has to cut his grass or his wife's man or his husband's or her husband's man, right? So make sure you, you manicure your lawn because otherwise you're gonna make me look bad that I'm wasting my time on Saturday. I want you to waste your time as well, right? So if you get any higher than X, you have to cut your grass. This is the grass police, right? We have an ordinance. If you don't cut your grass, I'm gonna give you a ticket. And if you still don't cut your grass, I'm going to give you another ticket, is what the rule's supposed to be, right? And if you don't get another ticket, you don't pay your ticket, then you can't, you know, I'm going to make you cut your grass, right? And some of the ordinances say, and if you get three tickets and you still don't cut your grass, we're going to cut the grass and send you a bill, right? And whatever that bill's going to be, right? So we're taking over for the grass industry, right? Some people, the ticket's cheaper than getting a grass cut because they're out of town, they're on vacation, they're on whatever, grass grow fast, they can get back in time, excuse me. So... Obviously, someone let their grass grow. What happens is what we learn happens. Because I, I watched this about 20 times. How does this guy say he wants to use eminent domain to take over this guy's property because he just won't cut his grass? What gets a yes? What gets a politician to ask a solicitor how we? You know, I don't like using eminent domain, but how can I use eminent domain to take this guy's property because he's just not cutting his grass? And the reality is you know that the authority of government in this little old town, that he's the solicitor, I'll use you for the example again, sorry man, but if you're the guy, you know, Johnny's not cutting his grass again, you better do something about it, right? What are you gonna do, your government, you, I, I want you to do something about it, right? So I want, I can't go use force on my neighbor, I can't force my neighbor to cut his grass. I can't fine my neighbor for not cutting his grass. I want you, I want government to do this job for me because I'm not allowed, but you are. We gave you that authority. Government has the authority to use force. Go take money out of their pocket. I can't walk up to you and take money out of your pocket. <laughs> Only government can. So I have to lobby government 
to make them use their force on someone else. And anytime you catch yourself using government to enact force on someone else, double think your moral rigid principles and your logical guidelines. Should you lobby government to use force on another individual? I want you to force them not to have their right to free speech, even if they're Antifa or whatever. No, I want you to enforce the ordinance on disturbing the peace, right? Causing a riot or something. These are normal laws, but to allow them to speak, let them speak. So here's a guy that you can just tell by listening to him, and I'm making some assumptions, that somebody got to him because he's frustrated. This guy doesn't care if that guy cut his grass. Do you really think he does? <laughs> right? But somebody is probably lobbying him into doing it. You're taking it for the you take the property, but you have to have a public use for the property to take it. You can't just take the property because you guys cut his grass. So he wants them to take the property because he didn't cut his how funny is this, right? I, I love that you're laughing because it is great, right? This is good stuff. When you watch this, this is know thy enemy. This is this part of the speech, right? So I don't like using eminent domain, but on this case, I want to use it for cutting his grass, right? This solicitor says, well, no, nah, you can't take the, you, you need it for a park or something, right? The next thing that's gonna happen is, hey, it sounds like this town needs a park. What would happen then, right? Back to abusive power. This park, this, this town needs a parking lot. <laughs> it's gonna be that guy's house because he doesn't cut his grass. I'll show you what my power does. Now think this through for a second. This is a little old Weiss port, right? Weisport's in, yeah, Weisport. Now think Ross Township. Think of the guy that was picking on that other guy. That the other two officials should have done something to stop that guy from abusing his power against that individual that was off kilter, mm. later found to be not off kilter or whatever. You know, let the, let the courts figure out how you can read it yourself. But the idea is when people abuse power, how do you fix it? And I don't want anyone to under, you know, even think about pulling a Ross Township. What you want to think about is taking their seat. And that's the goal. And when you got a guy like this that says, hey man, I'm in a domain. And if you have the wrong solicitor here that says, hey, we need a park. <laughs> you see how, the, how quickly this can go down the path, right? If you have Now he's telling all the ways. Now, now, you're, now he's telling you all the great ways you can go take stuff. You can use power. You, did you know you have this power? You, you can do a road. You can do a thing. What do you, what do you want to do? So every time he, um, every time the grass grows over the height of the hill property, um, they just send him a letter every well, time. With this one, you can see, this one is you give notice of a violation of the of the uh, quality of life ordinance, which you're able to issue a ticket. Sick your police, your authority on this individual. <laughs> Give the ticket. For the last few years, did everybody see this thing, by the way? Huh. I'm going to skip ahead until we're done. All right, so go look this one up on the internet. And it says, um, corruption in government is legal in America. Okay, I can skip ahead and do this stuff. Let's find out. Because this is a couple minutes, but um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to lower the volume. I'm going to get to the one that I did, and I'll tell you the other things we got. So this is represent us talking about corruption. It's a Princeton study that they, they went back multiple years and they found out what leverage you have as an individual on government and what leverage does a company have on government and they did the math and it sucks for us right but I wanted to get two more things out while you're here so um, here we actually this is where you want to do this one thing this is the part I want to hear 
On the right, at 100%, are ideas that everyone supports. This axis represents the likelihood of Congress passing a law that reflects any of these ideas, from a 0 to a 100% chance. On this graph, an ideal republic would look like this. If 50% of the public supports an idea, there's a 50% chance of it becoming law. If 80% of us support something, there's an 80% chance. You get the idea. Now, most Americans would probably agree that, with a few exceptions, we should be as close to this ideal as possible. Unfortunately, the way America actually works doesn't even come close. Take an idea that nobody supports, literally nobody, and it has about a 30% chance of becoming federal law. Now, take an incredibly popular idea, the most popular idea this country has ever seen, and there's also about a 30% chance of it becoming law. This means that the number of American voters for or against any idea has no impact on the likelihood that Congress will make it law. Put another way, and I'm just going to quote the Princeton study directly here, the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. So if you've ever felt like your opinion doesn't matter and that the government doesn't really care what you think, well, you're right. But there's a catch. This flat line only accounts for the bottom 90% of income earners in America. Economic elites, business interests, people who can afford lobbyists, they get their own line. Look at how much closer their line is to the ideal. When they want something, the government is much more likely to do it. And when they don't, they have the power to completely block it from happening, no matter how much the rest of the country supports it. They get what they want, and guess who ends up paying for it? We pay for it with the most expensive healthcare in the world. We pay for it with a tax code that's a complete mess. We pay so watch that one. It's really good. But the Princeton study, and I talked to the guys at Princeton before I even knew that this existed, and we were talking about the same concept. He said, you ought to read the study. And then these guys did this video, and I'm like, wow, this is great. But the study is correct. The, the reason it is you don't have leverage. An individual citizen has no leverage. So if you group together and create leverage, like we did in Bethlehem, like we did at the Lee Heighton School District twice, like we're doing in Carbon County right now for the commissioner's race, like you're doing for, when you create your own leverage, Franklin Township, right? You can get rid of that zoning guy that, that's churning it. You can get rid of it and it's all local level. I know this group is very big about the politics of the federal government, I want to steer you more towards some of your local opportunities and I want everybody to realize that take their seat and there's so many seats that are coronations. Nobody's running against them. Become an independent and get yourself on the ballot as soon as you see someone being in a coronation, right? Or, or, or stay a Republican and, and put it on there or be a Democrat and put it on there. But get competition in the primary, get competition in the uh, general election. Because if you can take these seats, and they're very inexpensive to own as an individual citizen, they're very easy to manage and maintain, and I found that there's a couple different people in the world, because I was one of them, and I got my ideas changed after 20 years of just barking from the outside. If you're so smart, go inside. And I'm like, ah, I'm smart, but I don't know. I don't know all about that stuff, right? At which point, we, we all underestimate our capability, and we step away. And the reality is, when you saw the other ones on this video, a little reading will put you laps ahead of your most vehement competition. They're horrible. They just don't know. And they don't want to know. They just want the dignitary spot. They want to sit there and hand out the diplomas. They want to sit there and, and say, well, I'm the guy. And then the other people in the background getting paid to do their work cutting grass four times a week, whatever it is, right? They're making all the money on your backs with nobody watching. So anyway, so um, remove every incumbent. What's the name of that video? Um, if you looked up uh, lobbyists in the Princeton study, it'll show up. But it's um, corruption is legal in America, I think, is the name of it. Thank you. Because it basically lets you know that all these guys that own lobbyists pay for it.
We fight lobbyists at a local election. You would never know how much money is being spent to stop you from having your voice. Pull their financials. It's amazing to watch with these people who's and who's paying it and what dark money's coming through. They they'll take it from one to another pack and then they'll bring it to someone else. Hand chosen. Right? Because he's gonna be my guy. Right? And they know they're gonna get in to be that guy. So anyway, so uh, we wanna leverage government by becoming a lobbyist ourselves, meaning we want to talk to government. We're going to ask them for information. We're going to share the information. We're going to talk to each other. You're going to share information with each other. Once you have the information, you have a network of people. Most organizations have this network of other people that provide this lobbyist group of telling people what to do, whether it's the oil cartel or the electric or the cable guy or this guy, he's telling people what to do so that you will do what he needs you to do because he wants his guy there that'll leverage what he needs, right? So remove incumbents. Once you're in office for one or two terms, get rid of them. They should, they should step aside noble, back to the moral rigid principles and logical guideline. The logical guideline is if you were in that office and I'll just, if you were commissioner for two, two terms and you left and you know everything you know, and you pass the torch to someone else and then you shared what you know and he was open-minded to listen to what you have and she's open-minded to listen to what they got. Now you have two people, not just one. But if you stay in, they get sticky, they start using that leverage and they realize they'd rather have the job than listen to the people. That's why they spend so much money on campaigns and no money about communication or asking people what they think, right? All right, there's another guy. How many people ever heard of Horatio Bunce? Anybody? Nobody? It's killing me. We're going to fix this in our schools. So Horatio Bunce, back in 1800-something, was working on his farm when Davy Crockett came up and said, Hey, Horatio, I want your vote. Right? And Davy Crockett stands there and says, Hey, I want your vote. And, and Mr. Farmer Man Bunce says, Hell no! I voted you for the first time, Dave, but no way. He says, well, what, what, what do you mean? He said, no way. You took money that wasn't yours to give, and you gave it to someone else. Never vote for you again. That's not how our Constitution works. And there's a whole article on it called Not Yours to Give, right? And you want to read it. It's basically back from the 1800s, David Crockett. And, he, and Dave Crockett, give him credit, listened to farmer Horatio Bunce that afternoon, understood what was going on, realized the mistake that he was making, that he was taking money from people by the use of force, and then using it for someone that he was not authorized to use it for. But it was charitable, he thought he was doing the right thing, he thought he was doing a good thing, but he knew better that he should not have given his money to them. If you thought charitable of that, you pull it out of your own pocket and help them. Or you act as government and say, hey, we got someone over here who needs help, can anyone here please individually decide to go help this person? Because I don't want to use force to take it from you and force you to help them, because you might not be in a position that you are capable of helping them. So as government, when you force somebody, anytime you do something that's by act of force, you're forcing them to do something. And you're now forcing them to use your morals because you want to help this person. And that's wrong. And it's ethically wrong. It's a moral standard. Now, if Dave Crockett, Dave Crockett would have known what his moral standards are before he got elected and knew that this was a moral standard to be reviewed, he wouldn't have done it. He would have either asked people to help pulled it out of his own pocket, or did whatever he needed to do. But the fact of the matter is, he didn't get his moral principles challenged until Horatio, a farmer on the side, when he's out asking for another vote, to give him an earful. So Dave Crockett said, all right, vote for me. I'll go back in the office. I'm going to go tell everybody what you just taught me so that the rest of our Congress can learn how not to do this stuff. Now, when you read it, it'll rip your eyes out and your heart, because what's going to happen is you're going to realize that our government ignored this story from then forward <laughs> because we constantly do it, right? Um, and then the allegory of the cave was uh, uh, Plato. That's this thing right here. I'll put them on anything else. Here. So the allegory of the cave is real simple. You got three uh, uh, three prisoners chained to chained to their their spot, and all they can see on the wall is shadows, right? 
they don't, and these things are parading across on them, you know, uh, vases and vessels and whatever, and they got this shadow that they see. And they, they were born into this bondage. All, it's, a, it's, an, it's a story of, of learning, right? So it's a parable. They were born, and this is all they know. One day, the middle prisoner, you know, is let free or escapes, goes outside, and finally realizes that what they were watching was the shadows, and that there, there's an object that made the shadow, and that object made a shadow because the sun was up there, and when he looked at the sun, he couldn't even see the things. So all he sees is just this infinite amount of light. But that's real, the shadow is fuzzy, the shadow is not real and, and can be distorted and reflected. So this is real, this is not. So he can't wait, he runs back to his other two prisoners, right? His, his buddies, his friends for his entire life, and says, guys, guys, we had it all wrong. Outside there's this thing, this sun thing, it shoots light and it makes a shadow and these are just the shadow, these things we see on the wall, they're not real. It's the things that cast these shadows that are real. And those two people, that are so ignorant to the world and has not experienced what this guy did because he never looked into the light. They never seen it, they didn't do it. They didn't have the same experience. Had no clue of how bad it was. And they would have rather killed this man than to, because they thought he went mad, than to listen to him and then understand. And that's why when you watch things that on here, now that we've educated you, hopefully you will, <laughs> You go on public, I and mean, if people want to cause you harm, right? And, and let's just put down the, the list so you know what you're getting into. I've been censored, censured, rebuked, sanctioned, sued. Uh, uh, First Amendment rights for filing a right to know. They filed a resolution saying you're not allowed to file them anymore. <laughs> what? But you have to defend it in court. It's going to cost you money, right? And then you got these slap lawsuits, strategic lawsuits against public participation. So as soon as you try to participate, they might sue you back to tell you not to, right? This is, a, this is a thing in Pennsylvania. You're allowed to do it. You're allowed to beat them up with lawyers. And when the government beats up a lawyer, they have an unlimited supply of funds. So it's something to consider. But at the same time, if you can take a little bit of the abuse, and believe me, I took a lot of it, try it. Raise your hand. You want to establish these moral principles, know what they are, right? Get your logical guidelines together. And if you see someone not acting in that way, you are the judge. You can call them guilty of that moral sin and that logical guideline in public. And they have to either dig in their heels and defend themselves or say, you know what, you're right. Davy Crockett stuff. Or do they not have character? And then you get to do it to them over and over and over until you rub their nose in it like a dog that shits on the crap, on the carpet, right? Your first time you take the dog outside, you say, don't do that. Second time you take the dog outside, you don't do that. That's about the third or fourth time you're rubbing the nose in it, right? That's where we're at here with these guys, you know? So, Allegory of the Cave, Horatio Bunce, get rid of the incumbents, learn how this works because you want to create your own lobbyist group so you can leverage them with your voting class. And the best way to have a voting class is just have one email list of all your voters so you can inform them every time you have something new that you want to share with them. And how many people of these videos that you saw, if I would have told you what they were without showing them to you, would you have believed me as to what was happening, what that mayor said, what that guy with the eminent domain of grass, how many people would you have believed me that that story existed? Anybody? So you're the other prisoners in the cave saying, I don't believe this stuff, you're crazy. But now that we show it to you this way, what do you think? It's amazing, right? And now when you look at what happened at Ross Township, when you look at what happened in Franklin Township, right? You look at the, the police officer, right? That was molesting that child. And then he moves to another police department after they know something's not right and they hire him and make him a chief and they already know he, <laughs> and, and you know what I mean? You got to think to yourself, what's going on? Right? Right. And then when, when uh, uh, an organization says, I'm going to let you resign, rather than fire you because you're bad. Well, <laughs> wait a second. Your moral obligation is if you did something, you, you fire the person. You don't say, I'm going to let you go and make sure the next guy can figure it out. All right, any questions? I know I'm long-winded. Was it helpful? Did it was at least entertaining? Yes. <laughs> yes. I just think going to those meetings might be some entertainment. Oh, it is. You know, yeah. the, uh, the these kids still want the 20 bucks. The kids still want the 20 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and actually they want more because it's not worth it. 
You mentioned the commissioners. Uh, what, what did you have in mind there? Uh, Carving, uh, just remove the incumbents. They get sticky. They once once the um, relationship becomes not the people that they're serving, but this chart here of the elites that they're serving that have the financial worth to help them get elected. That's who's steering that process. So um, there was a video of and a good guy, Tom Gerhardt, grabbing the gavel from the other guy. To, to gavel out someone for speaking, right? Did you see this? No, mm -hmm. So here you got three commissioners sitting up on the thing, right? You got the guy in the middle who's got the gavel, right? Who's that? Wait. You Wait. got it, right? So, and these two are partners, they're buddies, right? Mm -hmm. So he's got the gavel, he's the authority for running the meeting. And somebody in the meeting says, Wait a second, that guy got funding from this guy and he's authorizing this thing. What's going on? Right. At which point, Tom doesn't want the guy in the audience to have a say. He wants to shut him up. Stop it. Don't expose it, especially since you're recording. So he grabs the capital from Wayne to use Wayne's authority and shut up, you know, gavel the guy out, right? Stop, whatever. And Wayne's grabbing it back, and he's grabbing it back. They're fighting over this gavel. They shut this guy up, right? That's when you know you got a problem. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the funny part. The first time you see that this individual does not have a moral principle or a logical guideline, they got to be removed from office. you got to get them out. First time you see me, just tell me. I'll leave. I don't know. No, right, if I'm not noble enough to do it, no, I do. Won't. Well, I, I will either, well, I'll either, like Davy Crockett, admit it and change, accept it and fix it, right? Like a human being would. Or you have to get me out. You'd have to. And there's no problem with it. And, and to be honest with you, my wife and kids would love it. So no problem. <laughs> so, but the idea is that's the concept. You, you, if we hold them accountable the way Horatio Bunce did and said, wait a second, that wasn't right. And if the politician talks to those people after they've been elected, like Davy Crockett nobly and character driven did, he can learn that and fix it. He still shouldn't serve more than two terms or, or whatever reasonable term limits are. One, my thought is one, because it should be a revolving door because as soon as he revolves out, all your knowledge and information can go to the next guy. And it should be an accumulation of knowledge and experience. So that therefore, after four or five generations, right, of these people moving through the system, we have really intelligent, smart, knowledgeable people running, and then from then on, you're good, right? 